Hi, thank you very much for tuning into this Bible study. My name is Dave and I'm a Bible teacher and we are going through the book of Acts. We are in Acts chapter 23, where Paul is going to be uh, defending himself before the Sanhedrin. Um, we are wrapping up Acts. We only have a few more chapters to go. Uh, Acts has 28 chapters in it. Um, so 24 and 25, we're actually going to kind of combine those together. So between 24, 25, and 26, we're going to do that in two weeks. Then we have chapter 27, which is uh, the shipwreck. And then chapter 28 is Paul in Rome. Uh, not to completely give it away, but that's the next few weeks uh, that will wrap up the book of Acts. Um, then I'm going to take a little bit of a break, and then we're going to come back, and I'm going to start up on the next book, which is Romans, which is a letter that Paul writes to the Roman church. So what have we seen in Acts thus far? Acts is um, the Acts of the Apostles or the Acts of Apostolic Men. Uh, at the beginning of Acts, we saw Peter and the stuff he was doing, and then uh, it switches over to following Paul around Acts 9, and then we've been following Paul as he's done three missionary journeys, and he, throughout his third journey, he talked about and he felt the fact that he was called to go to Jerusalem, and from Jerusalem, he's going to go to Rome. So we saw two weeks ago him make it finally to Jerusalem, and last week he saw him um, arrested. Um, I mean, the mob tries to kill him at the, the temple. The uh, Pharisees tried to actually kill him, but the Roman garrison, the uh, Claudius, the Roman commander, um, arrested him and now is actually protecting him because he's discovered that he is a Roman citizen. And now Paul is standing before the Sanhedrin under the protection of Claudius to make sure that, that the Jews don't do anything to, to kill him because he is a Roman citizen. Um, but Claudius wants to find out and discover what does the Sanhedrin actually have against Paul. So that's the background of what we're leading up to uh, in Acts 23 today. So before we get in, as usual, why don't you bow your heads and let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word Thank you for Paul. Thank you for the work that he did and the sacrifices that he made. Lord, may we learn from Paul and from his testimony that he gives today before the Sanhedrin. Be here. Speak through me. Be, we, be with each of us now. We honor you. We love you. We give you this time. Be with us. Teach us. We want to be more like you. We want to learn from you. Change us from the inside out. We love you, Lord. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, why don't you open up, and we are going to cover Acts 23. I'm actually going to start it on verse 30 of 22, because um, it gives a little bit of background. And as usual, I'm going to read uh, a chunk and then come back and talk about it. My Bible is an NIV. Uh, if you have an NIV, follow along. If you don't have an NIV, um, I would suggest that you just listen so that you're not... Uh, uh, focusing on the nuances of the differences in the translations, but then when I go back and dissect and go verse to verse and explain, then definitely dig into your version. There's lots of great versions out there. If you don't have an NIV, that's not a problem. Uh, but just the, the point being is, is that I want you to first get the big picture, and then we go in and, and dissect a little bit. So picking it up on Acts 22 verse 30. The commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews, so the next day, he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the members of the Sanhedrin to assemble. Then he brought Paul and had him stand before them. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him in the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, how dare you insult God's high priest? Paul replied, brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest. For it is written, do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I am a Pharisee, descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. 
when he had said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees believe all these things. There's a great uproar and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously, we find nothing wrong with this man. They said, what if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him to the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Okay, so what's happening here? We know from last week that uh, Paul, uh, to the mob in the temple courts, um, defended himself, pointing out that he was a Pharisee among Pharisees, that he was part of them, that he believed in Jesus, and he tells the whole story of his, his road to Damascus. So now he's before the Sanhedrin. Let's talk about the Sanhedrin real quick, and then we'll come back to this and um, look at Ananias and what this means. So to give some context um, of the Pharisees first, why don't you flip over to Matthew chapter 23. So the Sanhedrin, I guess I'm going to explain the Sanhedrin first. Then I'll go to uh, Matthew 23. So you can keep a finger here. The Sanhedrin is the Jewish court system. Uh, it is based off of, there's two main scriptures. I didn't know this, um, and I found this out um, for today's study, uh, which is really cool. Numbers, you don't have to turn here. Uh, you can if you like, but Numbers 11:16, uh, The Lord said to Moses, bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Have them come to the tent of meeting that they may stand there with you. I will come down and speak with you there and I will take some of the power of the spirit that is on you and put it on them. They will share the burden of the people with you so that you will not have to carry it alone. This is the foundation of the Sanhedrin. It's 70 members of the Jewish leaders that are to decide all things as it relates to Israel. It is their court system. Now you have Sanhedrins, you have small ones that are in each town that are small little gatherings of the officials who decide local decisions as it relates to that city, that township. Then you have the great Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. This is the high court. This is the supreme court of the land. This is the same council of 70 elders that Jesus goes before. Another verse that I want to reference for the Sanhedrin is from Deuteronomy 16, 18. Deuteronomy 16, 18. Appoint judges and officials for each of your tribes in every town the Lord your God is giving you, and they shall judge the people fairly. Do not pervert justice or show partiality. Do not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the innocent. Follow justice and justice alone, so that you may live and possess the land the Lord your God has given you. The Sanhedrin was not a bad thing. It was set up by God as a council of elders to decide the laws and to decide uh, the, the judgment on uh, criminal charges on uh, if a person's guilty or innocent, a person would go before the Sanhedrin, their guilt or innocence would be determined, and then a penalty would be given. So now fast forward. This is in the, the uh, Pentateuch. This is in the first five books. So then fast forward to what is it in Jesus's day and in Paul's day, and it, it still is this council that decides things, but... Um, it is populated with now the elite of the town. It, it has become this status symbol. The Pharisees and the Sadducees are the two main groups. Um, th there are other groups that are part of it. Um, 
but the Pharisees and the Sadducees make up the majority of it. And then there's a high priest. And the high priest is the basically the Supreme Court judge that is over the whole group. Um, but there was so much pride. There was so much... Um, it was just broken and full of evil because at this point, um, it was the seats of honor to become a Pharisee, excuse me. Well, first of all, to be a Pharisee was a high, uh, level of society, but then to be in the Sanhedrin, you were in the top echelon and they would lord it over everybody else. It was no longer a thing of, um, doing what is right and doing justice. It was now um, a political system of superiority and class. And they were the highest echelon that uh, everybody should get out of their way when they're walking down the street, that sort of thing. So what does Jesus have to say about the Pharisees? This actually gives us a lot of insight into this group of people. Now, I just want to say real quick that Jesus is going to have, in Matthew 23, he has a lot of harsh words, and I'm going to read all of them. Um, and follow along with me as I do. Keep in mind, not all of the Pharisees were bad. Not all of the Pharisees are as Jesus describes them here. We know of two in particular. Nicodemus was a Pharisee that was intrigued and actually talked to Christ specifically about what it means to be born again. And we see that in the Gospels. We also have Joseph of Arimathea, is a member of the Sanhedrin and a Pharisee, and it's his tomb. He owns the tomb, and he is the one who is responsible for um, going to Pilate to get Jesus' body and have it um, be wrapped and be buried in the tomb. So these are two individuals that we know uh, love the Lord. Just a disclaimer before we get into... Uh, the hypocrisy and Jesus' harsh words against the Pharisees. Keep in mind, this is during Holy Week leading up to um, Jesus being crucified. And all, the all of the Jews have gathered in the temple courts to listen to Jesus. It's a mixture of Jews from all of the region that are there for the festival. But then you also do obviously have some Pharisees and Sadducees, but the majority of the, the mob is the local lay Jew person that is listening to this. So these are Jesus' words, uh, Matthew 23. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything that they tell you. The idea there is that Moses' seat is a seat of judgment. They have put themselves there in that seat. So you do need to respect them. You do need to listen to them. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on their people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything that they do is done for people to see, for show. They make their phylacteries wide and their tassels on their garments long. Phylacteries were... Um, things that these little tiny boxes that they would tie to their arms and to their foreheads and they would put bible verses into them and they would make them really really big so everybody thought they were truly holy people and their tassels were also uh, a sign of god's love and they would have really really long tassels simply to to up show the other person to to show how holy they were Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and their tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at the banquet and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect by the marketplace and to be called rabbi by others. But you are not to, call, to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all brothers. And do not call another any on earth father. For you have one Father, and He is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus had so many issues with the system that they had created that was all done for show and for pride. I think you still see that to this day where you see some churches where there's these seats of honor back behind the altar. You'll have these big places of honor where the important people sit. Minister. The word minister means servant. Jesus is talking about the fact that in order to be uh, first, you must be last. And those who want to, to, 
to lead and to, to do that must put themselves last. The Pharisees did not do that. The Sanhedrin did not do that. They did everything for show. Woe to you, teachers of the law, Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door on the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You oversee, you yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Woe to you, blind guides. You say if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by that oath. You blind fools. Which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gift of the altar is bound by that oath. You blind men. Which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes that gift sacred. Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by, by everything on it. And anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. If you want an explanation of that whole system, um, at the very end of this video, in the bottom left over here, I'm gonna put my talk on Matthew 23. And you can go and, and watch that, an explanation of these uh, eight woes or seven woes um, against the Pharisees. Verse 23, Woe to you, teachers of the law, and you Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matter of the law, justice, mercy, mercy and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without regulating the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You claim the outside of the cup and dish. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside, they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Obviously, he's not talking about dishes there. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. Again, the same analogy. On the outside, you look so pretty, but on the inside, you are disgusting. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous. By the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Verse 29, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you blind tombs for the prophets and de uh, decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them in shedding of the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead then and complete what your ancestors started. You snakes, you brood of vipers. How will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore being condemned to hell, therefore I am sending you prophets and sages and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in their synagogues and pursue from town to town. Jesus is talking about Paul right there. Read that again. I am sending you prophets and sages and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. That's a foreshadowing. Jesus is talking about what's going to happen to Paul as he's pursued from town to town. Paul's the fulfillment of that. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth from the blood of the righteous, able to the blood of Zechariah, son of Ber uh, Berkia, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I tell you, all this will come on this generation. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I truly tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's a reference to Christ's second coming. <clears throat> Jesus had some really, really, really harsh words to say against the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law because of the hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is a dangerous thing. I would argue it's the number one cause of atheism 
today is the hypocrisy of Christians. Christians who say one thing and then go out and do another. On Sunday, they go to church and are holy and sit and pray and sing songs. Then throughout the week, they don't stand on that same faith. Don't try to be perfect because you can't. Admit that you're broken and don't try to look like you're perfect. Admit your brokenness and just concentrate on Jesus. Just focus all of your attention on Jesus, praying, studying the Bible, learning who God is, and through that process, you will change. God will change you into the person, the man or the woman he wants you to be, and you will find peace and joy in that. You might not get rich, but you'll find peace and joy because you're being the person, you're being changed into the person that Christ wants you to be. Okay, where were we? Um, plot to kill Paul. So we are in Acts 23, verse 12. Kenzie is very clearly enjoying this talk. <laughs> Hi, Kenzie. Yes, are you relaxing? <laughs> I love this dog. Very sweet. Okay, where were we? Okay, so um, Paul is before the Sanhedrin. Okay, so let me explain just a little bit what's going on here. So um, the high priest... So we're back in the Sanhedrin. Uh, Paul has just give uh, had started to give his explanation, and then uh, all things go crazy, and the Sanhedrin goes nuts. Let me explain why this happens. First of all, Paul at the very beginning he says, "My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God and all good conscience to this day." So he's saying, "I haven't done anything wrong." And Ananias then has him struck, and we see a dialogue that goes back and forth. Let me just read real quick in our uh, Bible characters, who is Ananias? Now, we have seen in Acts three different Ananiases. Um, we saw in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, who sell their possession and act like they've given everything when they lied about it, and their fate was um, decided because of that. You also have in Acts 9, um, another Ananias, uh, and that Ananias is the one who actually goes to Saul when he's blind and is used by the Holy Spirit to talk to Saul in his conversion on the road to Damascus. But then the third Ananias that we have, another Ananias was high priest at the time of the Apostle Paul, Paul's arrest in Jerusalem. He was a proud and cruel Sadducean leader. He was appointed by Herod and held power from A.D. 47 to 59. In A.D. 52, he was sent to Rome to answer, char answer charges of cruelty. He was set free by Claudius, but this description helps us understand his personal intervention upon Paul's arrest. He ordered Paul to be slapped in the face during his trial. We're talking about that today and later personally went down to Caesarea in order to pursue the charges against Paul before Felix. So Ananias is an especially cruel puppet of uh, put there by Herod um, that is a Sadducee uh, that is the uh, high priest. Paul doesn't realize that he's the high priest. He says that he hasn't done anything wrong. And then Ananias has him struck. And this is where you see uh, Paul then say, um, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourselves violate the law by commanding I be struck. We learn very clearly right here from Paul's statements. Paul knows the law. Remember, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He knows his scripture very well. And he quotes Leviticus 19.15. You don't have to turn there now, but if you want extra homework, read Leviticus 19.15. And he's talking about the fact that, um, that, you, you're, that, that you're striking a person who hasn't been proved to be guilty. He hasn't done anything wrong is what Paul is saying, and yet you strike me and you're breaking the law and doing that. Those who are standing near Paul said, how dare you insult God's high priest? Paul then responds, brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest. For it is written, do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Again, he's quoting scripture. That's Exodus twenty-two twenty-eight that he's referencing there. So it's an interesting dialogue 
that happens here. Clearly, Paul and the high priest aren't getting off to a good start. Now, Paul does something here that if you just read through it, uh, you'll miss if you go through it really quickly. When he says here, my brothers, I am a Pharisee, descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. That is a loaded statement. Paul knew very well what he was doing. There was humongous tension and division in the Sanhedrin between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Both believe in God. Both are Jewish. The difference is the resurrection of the dead. That is a humongous division point. The Pharisees believe that there's life after death and that you will be resurrected, that there is a heaven and there is a hell. The Sadducees don't believe that at all. They believe that when you die, you're done. There is no resurrection of the dead. A, a saying that's easy to remember the differences between this is that the Sadducees are sad, you see, because they don't believe in the resurrection. They believe that when you die, you're done, which is why they're sad, you see, Sadducees. It's a fun little play on words. Paul is not saying that, uh, I mean, <laughs> He says this completely to cause an uproar. And the uproar that he causes prevents any, anything trial from even actually happening. Um, he's there on Trump charges anyway. They want to kill him. They want to come up with any excuse they can to kill him. Uh, as we're going to read when we continue on to verse 12. And so I just find it kind of funny. Paul knows exactly what he's doing. And he just pushes a button. Ding! I'm on trial because I believe in the resurrection. Oh, boom, 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 boom. And both sides immediately uh, are, are ready to fight and, and the fight breaks out. And it has nothing to do with Paul. It has everything to do with this argument um, of the division between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And that's what we see in this chunk. Okay, so now continuing on to verse 12. The next morning, some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priest and the elders and said, We have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petition the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the uh, centurions and said, Take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took him to the commander. The centurion said, Paul, the prisoner, sent for me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside and asked, What is it you want to tell me? He said, some Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They are ready now waiting for your consent to their request. The commander dismissed the young man with this warning. Don't tell anyone that you have reported this to me. Okay, so what's happening here? Nothing happened. Uh, no conclusion was made. Nothing happened from the first time the Sanhedrin met because, it, I mean, it was over before it even started. Uh, there's this uh, tension and uh, conversation between Paul and the high priest Ananias, and then Paul simply makes his statement, an uproar happens, and then the commander, Claudius, is so afraid that Paul is going to be torn to pieces that he has his soldiers go in and bring him back to the barracks. Nothing's been decided. So then you have this group of Jews, which is probably the Zealots. The Zealots were a religious group among the Jews who were zealot. That is where we get the word zealous, is that they were zealots for um, Jerusalem first, for Israel first. And in fact, it is that group that is going to eventually cause um, Titus to come in and absolutely de demolish and wipe out Jerusalem. It's the zealots that, that go about and cause that to happen. So this group of 40 zealots makes an oath that they will not eat or drink until Paul is killed. 
So then they go to the Sanhedrin and they say, okay, ask for Paul to come back because no conclusion was come, uh, happened from the first trial. Ask for him to come back and on the way when he's traveling to the Sanhedrin, we'll kill him. This then shows very clearly uh, how just the Sanhedrin is because they're like, yeah, that's a good idea. Do that. So that's where we're at now. So verse 23, then he called two of the centurions. This is uh, the commander, Claudius. Um, then he called two of the centurions and ordered them, get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at nine tonight, provide horses for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. He wrote a letter as follows. Claudius Lysisses, to his excellency, Governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and they were about to kill him, but I came with my troops and rescued him for I had learned that he is a Roman citizen. If I wanted to know why they were, excuse me, I wanted to know why they were accusing him. So I brought him to their Sanhedrin. I found that the accusations had to do with questioning about their law, but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. When I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to present to you their case against him. So the soldiers carrying out their orders took Paul with them during the night and brought him as far as Antip Antipyrus, Antipatrius, Antipatrius. The next day they let the cavalry go on with him while they returned to the barracks. When the cavalry arrived in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. The governor read the letter and asked what province he was from. Learning that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. Then he ordered that Paul be kept under guard in Herod's palace. Okay, so what has happened here? Keep in mind, as we talked about last week, Paul is in the temple and the Jews figure out who he is, specifically because of some Jews that were there in the Temple Mount from uh, the, the province of uh, Asia Minor, likely from Ephesus. They recognize Paul, they incite the mob, and they're going to kill Paul. The governor then, trying to quell any craziness that's going on, goes in, saves Paul, and asks, what is going on? Who is this guy? Uh, then he tries to make a defense to all of the people. Um, there's an uproar. He takes him out and he asks, what have you done? And he says to have him flogged and then present him to me so we can see what he's guilty of. Then Paul then says, I'm a Roman citizen. Is it right for you to flog me without a trial? And at that point, Claudius and his role in this whole situation shifts. I spoke about this before. He realizes that Paul is a Roman citizen. There is this humongous tension that exists between the Romans and the Israelites. Rome's job is to keep the peace, but they hold Roman citizenship above a local Jew, well above. They are treated differently. They're um, uh, held in high honor. They're not allowed to be crucified. They're not, they are protected from being hurt by anyone. It is a high status to be a Roman citizen. So Claudius realizes that Paul's a Roman citizen, and now he wants to find out, okay, well, why did the Sanhedrin want to kill you? Claudius then, under his protection, takes Paul to the Sanhedrin, in which we see this whole interaction between Ananias and Paul, and then the uproar that happens from that, and he realizes that Paul is not safe to, be, to stay in Jerusalem, so he sends, this, sends him on to the governor Felix. He passes it up the chain of command, and now what's going to happen in next week when we go on to Acts 24 is now Governor Felix is going to hear the testimony from the Sanhedrin officials, the, the, the Pharisees, their accusation of what they have against Paul, but now this is all under Roman control. In a Roman court, you are no longer in the Sanhedrin. He's going to hear both sides. He's going to hear Paul's defense as well as he is going to hear um, the accusations from the Sanhedrin. And we're going to hit on that next week. So what's the takeaway here? Well, from a historical cultural context as we're reading through this, we are getting... Uh, 
closer and closer to Paul. This is the reason why he is here, is, is that uh, he, as, as Jesus told him, you have presented and been on trial in Jerusalem, you're going to go to Rome. What's going to happen is he's, I'm, not, I'm, I'm giving it away completely what the next few weeks look like, but what's going to happen is that he is going to be passed off from one governor to the next to the eventual going all the way to Caesar in Rome. And through this process, his testimony is going to be told. And also, in this time of all these imprisonments that he's going to have, let's actually pull back up. Um, oh, I no longer have a marker for it. Um, the timeline of Paul's life, you see all the epistles that he writes. Several of them he writes in imprisonment that is going to be coming in the future. The thing that's crazy, and we're going to hit on it next week, under Governor Felix, this amount of time that he waits for this trial to happen, he waits for two years in prison. It's more of a house arrest. Because he is a Roman citizen, he's given the rights of a Roman citizen, he is protected by Rome, he's waiting trial, so he can't leave, but he's not in a dank, damp dungeon but he is imprisoned. You, you, you follow? And what's, but he's there for two years, and we're going to read that next week. I was reading ahead this morning of what's happening in Acts 24, and when I read that, I was like, oh my gosh, two years he spends. And in this two years, they don't, they don't think in this time that he actually writes any of his epistles. It's as he travels on and continues um, that he will write more epistles. So historical, cultural context, this is what happened to the Apostle Paul as he went from Jerusalem, and now he's before Governor Felix, and this is in the process of him going to Rome. What's the takeaway from today's lesson? The talk that Christ gave in the temple courts about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. We see the Pharisees in the Sanhedrin, this, this group that is supposed to be the teachers of the law and God's chosen people, to govern. They're in Moses' seat, as Jesus said in, in Matthew uh, 23, and yet they lord it over people. And the question I have for you, the takeaway for today's is, what hypocritical thing do you do? Do you say things to be perceived a certain way only for your own ego and your own benefit? Yeah, you do. I do. We all do. Just be cautious of that and realize that humility and admitting that you've made a mistake, admitting that you're not perfect, is the first step in, in, in growing in your relationship with Christ, is admitting the fact that you are not perfect, that you cannot be perfect, and just laugh at it and realize, oh my gosh, I can't believe I said that. Ask for forgiveness and, and repent and try to be better. So that's it for this week. Why don't you bow your heads and pray with me. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the courage that Paul had to go from uh, uh, place to place to place under trial and to defend his faith in you and to, that, that he stayed strong. I pray, Lord, that we too can stay strong in our faith, in our defense of our faith uh, among others when, we are, um, when our faith is tried. Lord, I pray that, that you will put on each of our hearts a desire to know you more and to have you come into our lives and to change us from the inside out. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Um, we'll see you next week when we go on to uh, Acts 24. And we'll cover part of Acts 25 as we see what uh, the trial before Governor Felix looks like. So have a phenomenal week. I love you guys. And I will talk to you next week.